Hi everyone, this is Michael Jacobs coming to you from Long Island, New York. Uh, we just had a really great PGA show in Florida, great PGA teaching and coaching summit, the yearly Manzella Jacobs uh, PGA show seminar, which we showed all brand new stuff. And what I wanted to do today for all the ex golf school students out there, for all the followers of the things that you know we like to talk about in the swing, is bring you kind of up to date, talk a little bit about. Uh, something, a theorem called the, the alternate hub path that we have come up with based on our research and also show you a little bit about Alpha Man. Uh, it was first introduced at the show so I think it would be interesting if everybody who follows along, especially the local ex call schools, if you can see exactly what we're going to be doing this year. Now, uh, the, the alternate hub path and one of the big subjects is always that's becoming more and more prevalent, at least in my day-to-day uh, -day operations, is everybody's asking me, Mike, the stuff is great, great information. Can you start telling us how we can make this practical in our everyday life? To me, it's going to be intuitively practical, but I can understand uh, how when it's new to people, you have to kind of sort through it. So what about the, the population of golfers who don't make a very big backswing? Like someone like me, for example, um, I played football growing up, and there was a lot of youth weightlifting back in the in the '90s, and the shoulders got bigger than and you know than they should have, and the ability to you know flex the arms on the backswing uh, has become limited. I've tried to work on it, but uh, to make a long story short, we kind of define a shorter backswing as how the actual balance point of the club, like the center mass of the club area, somewhere around here, is in relate where that is in relation to the hub path. So I got a nice shadow behind me. I'll uh, use the shadow for a second. So if I'm making a backswing and I get to this point, and you're looking at uh, the Facebook page of Postmodern Golf there, and I get to this point and the club, the center mass of the club, or the balance point of the club, is in line with my hands. That's kind of like the break-even point. If I stop my backswing there, now the rotational resistance when I pull down is going to be about at my hands. And what that's going to do is it's going to make it tougher for me to move my body faster and things like that. So people who are in the top of the backswing in that area they're going to have a tough time creating body speed and being able to uh, do the things that higher end players do when they uh, make a bigger backswing. So you take somebody, everybody always asks about, I guess J.B. Holmes would be a good example. And I remember I did a little story for this on, in a Golf Digest blog. Was his backswing is short and everybody's asked him to explain that. And then as he starts his downswing, what he does when he starts his downswing, he makes a move that puts this part of the club inside the path of the hands. So then he creates a much more advantageous position for himself. And I think you'll see regular golfers do this intuitively, or at least try to. They'll make what feels like a shorter backswing, and then what they'll do on the downswing is they'll start to create alternate hub paths to try to keep the club head inside the path of their hands. And the classic is your over the topper. So if I make a backswing and then I come over the top, this type of action is actually lowering the resistance from the club and giving me a chance to create some leverage to transfer the energy later. If I just left the club like this and came down, there would be almost nothing left. So. When you're going to work with your own swing or work with someone and trying to, you know, re-engineer maybe a little change in your swing for the season, that's some place you want to look. So ideally on the back swing, I'm going to turn this way so you can see the shadow. And this is a great way to practice, by the way, uh, with a little shadow. It is right here on the back swing. You can see this part of the club is lined up with my hands. And now as I make a bigger back swing and this club flops, so to speak, I don't know if flops is the best word, but works its way on this side of the hub, then when I start my downswing and I pull my hub path, the resistance is really low and the club is moving very much almost in a straight line. If anything, it's rotating right around here, so the resistance is very low. Those are going to be your longer hitters, people who can 
turn their body faster because the swinging resistance of the club is much, much lower. So there's a huge advantage to that. Back to a good player, all possible alternate hub path. And what I do actually have been doing with a lot of students of late. And this swing came up the other day, question from Paul Wayland, who uh, leads the league in questions asked. Uh, I try to only answer about 25% of them. So he asked me to talk about the alternate hub path. So what this type of angle that you see, everybody says, oh, look at his wrist, and look at that little funny move he does with his wrist at the top of the backswing. But if you think about it, if that's pretty much the end of his backswing, you could see that if he didn't do this with his wrist and the club was over here, he'd be in that situation where this, the actual balance point of the club is barely inside his hub path. But by doing that wrist motion, right, by doing this wrist motion, I'm going to suggest from our research what we found is by creating an alternate route for the hub path, he can get that same effect as if somebody did make that bigger backswing and was able to pull the right way. So by having that club in an alternate hub path and starting his downswing, he's getting the same effect. It's just an alternate route to get there. So something along these lines is a really good uh, place for someone who has a shorter backswing. Now, there are some areas of trouble that you can get into uh, when you take this alternate route, and we're going to get to that next before we look at a couple of alpha man things. Uh, and that's the way that the golfer pulls down. So we're going to get to that next. But uh, that's the introduction to the alternate hub path. And now let's take a look at the pull down effect of the club and some trouble that people get into when they do that. We're looking at one of the parameters in um, Dr. Stephen Nesbitt and myself's analysis system. And this is the overall linear force applied to the, to the club, to the grip by the golfer. So picture we have a little reference frame on the ground, and we're looking about how, how the golfer is forcing that club, everything included, whether gravity is assisting or anything like that. And it's uh, giving us an idea of how the golfer is pulling on the club. Well, you can see that predominantly it's outside this way. So for this golfer, who I was working with, you look at the blue, just to take you through these things. Green is the club head. Blue are the shafts. Red is the hub path. And there's the quivers of force, we call them. So here's what we got. So the club, I'll put this up so you can see it. So here's the club, it's a little longer club, and the club head is there. But, and you can see there it is at the top. And then there's the force quiver. So the way that uh, this gentleman's name was Martin, he's from Europe, he was here to work with me. And that means at the start of the downswing, when he started the linear force at the, at the grip, was pulling the club this way, and then eventually started pulling it down. And you could see the reorientation of the shafts as it comes. But Martin gets himself into a real interesting location that a lot of mini tour players are coming. And I call this the mini tour syndrome. It's from over pulling and over trying to lay the club down. For some odd reason, I see a lot of people out there coming with this hard desire to pull this way and try to lay the club down. Um, not quite like that alternate hub path, they're doing it in the middle of the, you know, of the, after transition into the downswing. And I want you to take a look an interesting little bit here. So if you were one of these little force quivers and we just pulled on the club with whatever magnitude, the club would want to follow along. So in a perfect little environment with nothing else really happening, there's a lot happening, like the shape of a hub path, torque, all that stuff. But if we just pulled along, you could see how the club would want to follow. And usually the pull that the golfer puts on the club, if it's off center from uh, the balance point of the club, there'll be a rotational response to the club. So you could do like a free swinging type thing where the club um, responds to how you're pulling on it. And that's going to be dependent not only on how you pull on it, it's going to be closely intertwined as a reaction to how the hub path moves. And then there's also a twisting action that you can do to help it uh, do nothing or negate it. 
But when you look at this mini tour syndrome, you're going to notice that the direction of the pull is almost in line with the club the whole time. It's unbelievable. Even here, and you look at this club here and the quiver, it's only slightly offline. And that's what these golfers have developed. What they've developed is, and I'm going to show you the transition in a second, is the attempt to pull really hard. Now, in Martin's case, he told me when he trained when he was young, he would pull a cable of weights all the way down to impact. And you know what? He got really good at it because that's still in his swing. So when he's coming down, he's pulling the club very aggressively and pulling along the club and creating little to no angular response. And he's also applying a little bit of torque, a twist at the wrist to try to hold the club from coming out as his hands move out this way. And he had a lot of what we call binormal force like this, which really puts himself in a tough spot. And then the body decentrates and you can only imagine. Now, what does this mean? Well, the transition move, I'm going to show you a new parameter for a second. The transition move needed a lot of work. So let's take a look at a parameter that no one has seen just yet. A lot of parameters we haven't shown yet. And they'll be coming out in the big textbook, uh, do this summer to fall. And it's, we map out the path of what the hub is actually rotating around. And we look for how it's moving. And it's very, very descriptive of what the golfer is doing. It's like a quick little symptom or a quick little trait that we could look at and make some really good assumptions and conclusions when we're trying to help somebody. It kind of really picks the needles out of the haystack for uh, the way we operate. Um, will the rest of the golf world use something like this? I think it might be five to ten years ahead of its time, but we find it really helpful. We hope a lot of people will start to look at it after they read in the textbook how to map it out. In the textbook, it's going to map. It's going to show you how to map out all these movements of the club and hub uh, with video. So that's the that's the plan. So here's what's happening. So the way that Martin, in this case, was pulling down because when he was coming into his downswing, I'll put this right on the red hub pad, he was pulling this way, getting to the top of the swing, and abruptly pulling like this as he started his downswing, it created a path to the curvature center that was under the hub this way. So if I did something like this, just to help you describe it, and I did like a real over-the-top move like this, the way that my hub is rotating and what it's curving around, the way the hub is moving, is somewhere out here, if we looked where it was moving. And if I did the opposite, and I did something like Martin did and pulled this way, the, the path of curvature of what the hub's in is somewhere under and below the plane. So, the laydown community is creating a chronic case of early downswing, center of curvature path under the hub. Almost impossible to recover from unless you do something along the lines of horsing it around and then getting the curvature center to go outside the hub, which is very hard to do and almost impossible to master. So if you look at the three-dimensionality of it, as he's coming into impact or near impact, you can see that it's still staying below the hub. So this golfer, as um, I worked with him, and I was able to reduce it, is putting a lot of force out of the plane this way. When we put the coordinate system on the hub, which we like to do, we see that it's a binormal force. So for the lay down club, for people who love talking about uh, the pull and how the club is moving. The curvature of the hub is a big deal and the path of that. If I had one suggestion for people training out there, it would be to hold the club right here, assuming you can make a backswing of this length, and practice moving the club and curving the hub in a uniform motion and not getting that hub to curve in any crazy positions. And the closer you move to that, I think you'll start to standardize what you're doing. I think maintenance and endurance of your swing will start to grow. 
Uh, we call the relationship between this and this the relative swing plane, and it's something we'll get into even more. And it's not, it's a great thing, and it's great theorems, and it's great models, but if you can't use it in your everyday golfing, teaching, and we make this popular for everyday golfers, this just sits on a bookshelf in Manorville, um, which Manorville is a great town, and there's a lot on the bookshelf in Manorville, and uh, I'm even on the bookshelf half the time. So that's important. Let's take a quick look at Alpha Man and show you what this hard pulling transition would look like in a full body model, and what's to come from the work of myself and Dr. Steven Nesbitt. So from back in the day, when Dr. Steve introduced a lot of his research to the golf world, there was a full body biomechanical analysis paper that he wrote, and where he modeled the human body uh, with a multi-linked segment, and the properties of the body are inherent in the actual multi-body, multi-segment uh, model. And we have created a similar version, or in the process of finalizing it, and we're going to have the first ever full body biomechanical analysis of a golfer that will be used in an everyday golf arena. Now, let's take a look at the modern version. The name of the person, the model, I went with Alpha Man. Some people said I should have said Alpha Person or Alpha Being to be politically correct, but you know, there's Ping Man out there, there's some other things, so we went with Alpha Man in the spirit of the great Alpha Society. So let's take a look further at this particular model that we're developing. So I want to preface so I want to preface this one swing that we're going to look at as a swing that was troubled, that needed a lot of work. So this is not your ideal model swing. And the reason I chose this is because this is the mini tour syndrome that I presented on when in Florida and then soon to present on over in Europe. Now, what are you looking at? Well, of all the segments of the body, each segment, what we have here is the center of mass of every segment. So we always talk about the center of mass of the club, where you talk about the center of mass of the overall body, which is represented here, and then there's a smear projection on the ground. But here's the center of mass of every segment of the full body model. And it's based on the properties of the human body. So it gives us a really good idea of how the body is generating things from within to move the whole system in club. So this is a big deal. So you're going to see these center masses and the overall ones move, impact, and beyond when I play this little animation. And what I want you to understand and notice is this is the mini tour syndrome golfer. This is that mini tour syndrome golfer who pulls crazy and then has a desperate late angular. You're going to see this golfer is a supreme handle dragger. This isn't Martin, this is a different player. And you're going to see just how awkward and how uh, jumbled up all the centers of the body, the mass centers of the body are. And then we're going to look at the mass center linear velocities afterwards. So let's play the innards of Alpha Man here. So here he's coming down. You can see the lower segment of the lower back is pushed well forward. This golfer created quite a big virtual spine and gears away. Here you can see the strong handle drag pull. There you can see the center of mass of the overall body on the right side and the smear of it on the ground. You can see it stayed pretty much between the feet there, which is interesting. And that gives you an idea of uh, the mass centers of every single segment. That's what I presented on at the show. Now, when we go a little further, Let's look at the linear, a quiver, a linear velocity of each of these mass centers. So you can see little quivers starting to appear from each one to show you the linear, linear velocity. So uh, you can see that I'm, we're tra I'm tracking this one right here at the start of the down, uh, end of the backswing, start of the downswing. So you can see here that this is each segment. You can see that they're still going, uh, the velocity is still going in the backswing direction. And you can see this part of the arm is trying to 
you know, move in a different direction, you can see how each part of the body is linearly uh, moving. So you can see that these parts of the body are starting to move this way, arms are going back, and you can see how, just how that type of action with the lower ellipsoid moving forward. So let's, let's watch it go and uh, take a look. So I'm just going to let it play. So here you're going to see a really strong linear velocity of the arms downward. So this golfer definitely, uh, he told me that he was really trying to pull the club down uh, and really trying to get his hands forward at impact even with the driver. So there you can see the linear velocity of that upper arm segment um, and what's, what's really happening. Look how those arm, I mean, look at the linear velocity of the mass center of the arm. Pretty drastic. As time goes on and we show you all the high levels of player, I think you're going to see a different look. So you can see that this golfer is hitting a driver no less. And you can see just how jammed up this golfer is going to be and how late he is at redirecting the force down at the bottom of the swing. I mean, look at the uh, velocity of the mass centers of each arm. So it's a really interesting approach. So this is the innards of Alpha Man. Uh, and then he'll be, each segment of the body will be represented by a full ellipsoid, all 15 segments. And we're going to start to see things that nobody's ever looked at in a golf lesson setting. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun. And I couldn't be any prouder and happier with the team that we have. Um, my mentor, Dr. Steven Nesbitt, he's as good of a guy as there can be. And the way that he conducts his research and works with me is something I'll forever be grateful for. So um, the future looks bright. Here's the current thing, and hopefully this opens up some questions for the ex-Gall schoolers out there, and we could start to have further discussions. But here's the February 2017 Explosive Golf Show, now called the Jacobs 3D Instructional Show, and we will see you soon. Thank you.